Thanks for joining us for another Contagion Coronavirus video. Today we're joined by Dr. Wendy Bamberg, who is Contagion's Emerging and Re-Emerging Section Editor. Thank you so much for joining me, Dr. Bamberg. Thanks for having me, I'm happy to be here. So Dr. Bamberg, you have a lot of knowledge about public health from your, um, you know, your background and all these years in the field. So I was thinking we could just start by talking about, you know, from a public health perspective, what are some of the biggest challenges that we face when a novel virus such as SARS-CoV-2 emerges? Yeah, so the, one of the first challenges is the initial detection of that novel emerging pathogen. So we really rely on early surveillance systems, including regional surveillance of symptoms, so what we call syndromic surveillance, as well as astute clinicians who are on the front lines of delivering healthcare. Sometimes in countries with weaker health systems, detection of a novel pathogen can be delayed. Additionally, the most devastating effects can be seen in countries with weak health systems or ongoing conflicts, as we have seen with Ebola in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Countries with other ongoing infectious disease epidemics also can be more impacted. Things we wanna know early on include, how is the pathogen transmitted? Who is it most at risk of developing illness or developing severe illness? And where are the hot spots of early transmission? These things help public health determine what prevention measures to begin to implement. Other challenges include ensuring accurate diagnosis. So healthcare and public health both need rapid development and distribution of accurate tests. Also developing and discovering effective therapeutics as well as developing a vaccine, which takes time. As the pandemic spreads, other issues begin to emerge. Lack of supplies such as personal protective equipment and reagents needed for testing, the safety of healthcare workers and other essential workers and overwhelming the healthcare system become challenges. Ensuring timely, consistent, and accurate information also can be a challenge, as well as information overload. Right, so um, I guess my next question for you is, right now, you know, the biggest message to Americans is social distancing. So, you know, what, can you speak to how important social distancing is in situations like this, like a pandemic? Yeah, that's a great question. So in, in many places in the US, we've really moved into a phase of mitigation, which means trying to slow the spread of disease when we might not be able to intervene for every case. And so right now, social distancing is critically important. So one way, uh, one way to understand the importance of uh, social distancing is to take the concept of the reproductive number, which is also called the r naught. This is the number of others that one person will on average transmit the disease too. So factors that influence the reproductive number include characteristics of the virus itself, such as how contagious it is and how susceptible people are to infection because of those characteristics. We can't influence those factors, but there are factors that influence the reproductive number that we can affect. The number of contacts between people and the duration of those contacts. And this is where social distancing comes in. Another important consideration for social distancing right now is the effect that asymptomatic transmission is having on the spread of the virus. If the virus only spreads when people have symptoms, it would be easier to identify who has the virus and isolate them. We are seeing more reports that the virus can be transmitted before symptoms develop. This can be asymptomatic transmission if someone never develops symptoms, or what we're calling pre-symptomatic transmission if someone later develops symptoms. An early report out of Singapore indicated that the virus might be transmitted between one to three days prior to symptom onset. One other thing I'd like to note, when we talk about the term social distancing, what we're really talking about is physical distancing. Maintaining those social, social connections using technology is really important during this physical distancing period. So right now, uh, as we're speaking, um, it seems like in the, new, in the United States, the New York area is um, you know, being the hardest hit. So do you think that public health officials in other states and cities can use these lessons that are being learned and have been learned in New York and apply them to response in other areas where they're starting to just now see an increase in the cases? Yeah, so public health officials are absolutely what's watching what's happening, not just in their jurisdiction, but also what's happening across the U.S. and around the world. 
uh, the entire public health and healthcare community continues to learn from each other during this pandemic. Not just lessons from New York, but listen, lessons from Italy, China, South Korea, and other states like California and Washington. What we seem to be seeing is that early social distancing seems to be working. It does take time to see that effect since the incubation, for period, incubation period for COVID-19 averages around five to six days, but can be anywhere between two to 14 days. As we begin to see evidence that cases are leveling off and then decreasing, and once distancing restrictions are loosened, public health officials will be able to watch what happens across the country and around the world to apply lessons learned to their own communities. So this situation kind of seems like it's really escalated over time. Um, so currently, how are persons who are under investigation for COVID-19 being managed? Yeah, and that's a great question, and it kind of happens across different stages. Um, so initially, the usual public health me methods were employed. This includes reporting of cases to public health, investigating those cases to make sure sick people are isolated, identifying contacts of those people, and then quarantining contacts with exposures. Also, local outbreaks are identified and investigated. An early report from Santa Clara County in California used Sentinel surveillance, which monitors an identified group of healthcare facilities. In this, group, in this case, it was four urgent care centers for patients that develop a certain set of symptoms, in this case, fever, cough, and shortness of breath. They found 23% positive for influenza, then a subset of persons testing negative for influenza were tested for COVID-19 and 11% were positive for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. In this way, they were able to establish that local community transmission was occurring. As cases increase, it does become impossible for public health to investigate every case. And so other strategies might need to be used. So for football fans, this might be analogous to zone defense instead of man-to-man. -man. This is the phase that much of the US is in right now and interventions include physical distancing, public messaging, reliance on healthcare providers to relay information to patients regarding isolation and quarantine for the ill and exposed. When not everyone can be tested, there's also a need to be, begin to understand who might be ill with the disease, even when they can't be tested. So these might be classified as suspect or probable cases. Other types of surveillance strategies that might collect information in this phase include Sentinel surveillance, which is using a subset of healthcare facilities to understand what might be happening in the whole community. Syndromic surveillance, which is using a set of symptom criteria to monitor and understand trends. Monitoring hospitalizations and ICU admissions, and also using mortality-based surveillance, which might include reviewing death certificates. As mitigation strategies begin to work and the curve levels off, the suppression phase begins. And during this phase, we hope that public health might be able to switch back to strategies used initially, including the investigation of individual cases, identification of contacts, and the use of isolation and quarantine. During this phase, we hope to see increased capacity for testing, a variety of surveillance systems to capture probable as well as confirmed cases, and less strain on the healthcare system. By the time we get to this phase, cases are at a man manageable level and systems are in place to respond to suspected cases to get them diagnosed and isolated and contacts identified and quarantined. During all of these phases, phases, it's important to consider the ability of individuals in society to maintain isolation and quarantine practices. We must consider the most vulnerable among us, such as persons experiencing homelessness, and populations that are underserved in our healthcare system. And also remember to address issues of health equity. Now, this is obviously not the first nor the last pandemic that the world will see. So what should we be taking note of to be better prepared for next time? Yeah, so the interesting thing about public health is that when it's working and systems aren't stretched past capacity, you don't know it's there. It's so important in between crises that public health systems are maintained. This includes maintaining expertise, resources, supplies, and programs that can prepare in between crises and respond during a crisis. It's easy to forget about these needs when there isn't a crisis, and then we're all slower to respond when a crisis develops. It's also important to factor in supply chain issues 
healthcare worker safety and surge capacity needs, all things we're seeing stretched past the limit in the current pandemic. So those are all the questions that I had. Do you have any final thoughts that you wanna share? Yeah, thanks for asking. I'm, I'm really struck by how healthcare and public health are working so closely together. There's so many heroes, um, environmental services, dietary staff, support staff, first responders, and healthcare providers who are all on the front lines in healthcare. Public transportation workers, grocery store employees, delivery services, all of whom work to keep society running. I'd really like to take a moment to thank everyone who is working directly in and indirectly to support our society during this pandemic. Dr. Bamberg, I just want to say thanks so much for joining us today and thanks for all the great work that you do for Contagion, especially in the emerging and re-emerging infection section. Thanks so much for having me today. It's been a pleasure to be here.